Chapter Two, Serpent and Dove by Shelby Mahern. The Chasseur, Lou. I'm listening, sitting in the crowded patisserie. Boss lifted a spoonful of chocolate shod to his lips, careful not to spill a drop on his lace cravat. I resisted the urge to flick a bit of mine at him for what we had planned, we needed him in a good mood. No one could swindle an aristocrat like Boss could. It's like this, I said, pointing my spoon at him. You can pocket everything else in Trimbley's vault as payment, but the ring is ours. He leaned forward, dark eyes settling on my lips. When I irritably brushed the chocolate from my mustache, he grinned. Ah, yes, a magic ring. I have to admit I'm surprised you're interested in such an object. I thought you renounced all magic. The ring is different. His eyes found my lips once more. Of course it is. Boss, I snapped my fingers in front of his face pointedly. Focus, please. This is important. Once upon arriving in Cesarin, I thought Boss quite handsome. Handsome enough to court. Certainly handsome enough to kiss. From across the cramped table, I eyed the dark line of his jaw. There was still a small scar there, just below the ear, hiding in the shadow of his facial hair, where it had bitten him during one of our more passionate nights. I sighed ruefully at the memory. He had the most beautiful amber skin and such a tight little ass. He chuckled as if reading my mind. All right, Louis, I shall attempt to marshal my thoughts as long as you do the same. Stirring his chocolate, he sat back with a smirk. So, you wish to rob an aristocrat, and you have of course, come to the master for guidance. I scoffed, but bit my tongue. As the third cousin twice removed of the baron, Boss held the peculiar position of being part of the aristocracy while also not being part of it. His relative's wealth allowed him to dress in the finest fashions and attend the fanciest parties. Yet the aristocrats couldn't bother to remember his name a useful slight as he often attended said parties to relieve them of their valuables. A wise decision, he continued, as twists, as twits such as Tremblay utilize layers upon layers of security, gates and locks and guards and dogs, just to name a few, probably more after what happened to his daughter. The witches stole her during the dead of the night, didn't they? He'll have increased his protections. Felipe was becoming a real pain in my ass. Scowling, I glanced toward the patisserie's window. All manner of pastries perched there on glorious display. Iced cakes, sugar loaves, and chocolate tartlets, as well as macaroons and fruit danishes of every color. Raspberry eclairs and an apple tart tatin completed the display. Out of all this decadence, however, the enormous sticky buns with their cinnamon and sweet cream made my mouth truly water. As if on cue, Coco threw herself into the empty seat beside us. She thrust a plate of sticky buns toward me. Here. I could have kissed her. You're a goddess. You know that, right? Obviously. Just don't expect me to hold your hair back when you're puking later. Oh, and you owe me a silver consarone. Corone. <laughs> Like hell, that's my money too. Yes, but you can weasel a sticky bun out of pan any time. The corone is a service fee. I glanced over my shoulder at the short, plump man behind the counter, Johannes Pan, pastry extraordinaire and half-wit. More important, however, he was the close personal friend and confidant of Mademoiselle Lucida Britton. I was Mademoiselle Lucida Britton with a blonde wig. Sometimes I didn't want to wear the suit, and I'd quickly discovered Pan had a soft spot for the gentler sex. Most days I only had to bat my lashes. Others I had to get slightly more creative. I shot Boss a covert look. Little did he know he'd committed all sorts of heinous acts to poor Madame as well Breton over the past two years. Pan couldn't handle a woman's tears. I'm dressed as a man today. I tucked in the first bun, shoving half of it into my mouth without decorum. Asides, it prefers, I swallowed hard, eyes watering, blondes. <laughs> Heat radiated from Boss's dark gaze as he watched me. Then the gentleman has poor taste. Ich, 
Coco gagged, rolling her eyes. Give it a rest, will you? Pining doesn't suit you. That suit doesn't suit you. Leaving them to bicker, I returned my attention to the buns. Though Coco had procured enough to feed five people, I accepted the challenge. Three buns in, however, the two had turned even my appetite. I pushed the plate away roughly. We don't have the luxury of time, boss, I interrupted, just as Coco looked likely to leap across the table at him. The ring will be gone by morning, so it has to be tonight. Will you help us or not? He frowned at my tone. Personally, I don't see what all the fuss is about. You don't need an invisibility ring for safety. You know I can protect you. Poofed. Empty promises. Perhaps that was why I'd stopped loving him. Boss was many things, charming, cunning, ruthless, but he wasn't a protector. No, he was far too worried about more important things like saving his own skin at the first sign of trouble. I didn't hold it against him. He was a man, after all, and his kissing had more than made up for it. Coco glared at him. As we've told you several times, it grants the user more than invisibility. Ah, uh, I must confess I wasn't listening. When he grinned, blowing her a kiss across the table, her hands curled into fists. Bordel. I swear one of these days I'm going to... I intervened before she could slash open a vein. It renders the user immu immune to enchantment, sort of like the Chaucer's Balisardus. My gaze flicked to Boss. Surely you understand how useful that might prove to me. His grin vanished. Slowly, he reached up to touch my cravat, fingers tracing it with the fingers tracing where it hid my scar. Chills erupted down my spine. But she hasn't found you. You're still safe. For now. He stared at me for a long moment, hand still raised to my throat. Finally, he sighed. And you're willing to do whatever it takes to procure this ring? Yes. Even magic? I swallowed hard, threading my fingers through his and nodded. He dropped our clasp hands to the table. Very well, then. I shall help you. He glanced out the window and I followed his gaze. More and more people had gathered for the prince's parade. Though most laughed and chatted with palpable excitement, unease festered just beneath the surface in the tightness of their mouths and the sharp, quick movements of their eyes. Tonight, he continued, the king has scheduled a ball to welcome his son home from Amadine. The entire aristocracy has been invited, including Monsieur Tremblay. Convenient, Coco murmured. We all tensed simultaneously as a, at a commotion up the street, eyes locking on the men who emerged through the crowd. Clad in coats of royal blue, they marched in rows of three, each thump, 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 of their boots perfectly synchronized with the silver daggers held over their hearts. Constables flanked them on either side, on either side, shouting and marshalling pedestrians to, the, to sidewalks. Chasseurs. Sworn to the church as huntsmen, Chasseurs protected the kingdom of Belterra from the occult, namely the Dames Blanches, or the deadly witches who haunted Belterra's small-minded prejudices. Muted anger pounded through my veins as I watched the Chasseurs march closer, as if we were the interlopers, interlopers as if this land hadn't once belonged to us. Not your fight, lifting my chin, I mentally shook myself. The ancient feud between the church and the witches didn't affect me anymore, not since I'd left the world of witchcraft behind. You shouldn't be out here, Lou, Coco's eyes followed the Cheshire's as they lined the street, preventing anyone from approaching the royal family. The parade would start soon. We should reconvene in the theater. A crowd this size is dangerous. It's bound to attract trouble. I'm disguised, struggling to speak around the sticky bun in my mouth. I swallowed thickly. No one will recognize me. Andre and Gru did, only because of my voice. I won't be reconvening anywhere until after the parade. Dropping my hand, Boss stood and patted his waistcoat with a salacious grin. A crowd this size is a glorious cesspool of money, and I plan on drowning in it, if you'll excuse me. He tipped his hat and wove through the patisseries tables away from us. 
Coco leapt to her feet. That bastard will, will, will renege as soon as he's out of sight. Probably turn us into the constabulary, or worse, the chasseurs. I don't know why you trust him. It remained a point of contention in our friendship that I would revealed my true identity to Boss, my true name. Never mind that it happened after a night of too much whiskey and kissing. Shredding the last bun in an effort to avoid Coco's gaze, I tried not to regret my decision. Regret changed nothing. I had no choice but to trust him now. We were linked irrevocably. She sighed in resignation. I'll follow him. You get out of here. Meet us at the theater in an hour. It's a date. I left the, pati the, the patisserie only minutes after Coco and Boss. Though dozens of girls huddled outside in near hysterics at the prospect of seeing the prince, it was a man who blocked the doorway. Truly enormous, he towered over me by head and shoulders, his broad back and powerful arms straining against the brown wool of his coat. He, too, faced the street, but it didn't look as if he was watching the parade. He held his shoulders stiffly, feet planted, as if preparing for a fight. I cleared my throat and poked the man in the back. He didn't move. I poked him again. He shifted slightly, but still not enough for me to squeeze through. Right. Rolling my eyes, I threw my shoulder into his side and attempted to wedge myself between his girth and the door jamb. It seemed he felt that contact because he finally turned and clubbed me square in the nose with his elbow. Shit! Clutching my nose, I stumbled back and landed on my backside for the second time that morning. Treacherous tears sprang to my eyes. What the hell is wrong with you? He extended a swift hand. My apologies, Monsieur. I didn't see you. Clearly... I ignored his hand and hauled myself to my feet, brushing off my pants. I made to shove past him, but he, once again, blocked my path. His shabby coat flapped open at the moment, revealing a bandolier strapped across his chest. Knives of every shape and size glinted down at me, but it was the knife sheathed against his heart that made my own drop like a stone. Gleaming and silver, it was adorned with, large, with a large sapphire that glittered ominously in his hilt. Chasseur. I ducked my head. Shit. Inhaling deeply, I forced myself to remain calm. He presented no danger to me in my current disguise. I'd done nothing wrong. I smelled of cinnamon, not magic. Besides, didn't all men share some sport, some sort of unspoken camaraderie? A mutual understanding of their own collective importance? Are you injured, monsieur? Right. Today I was a man. I could do this. I forced myself to look up. Beyond his obscene height, the first thing I noticed were the brass buttons on his coat. They matched the copper and the gold of his hair, which shone in the sun like a beacon. Combined with his straight nose and full mouth, it made him unexpectedly handsome for a Cheshire. A Cheshire. Irritatingly handsome. I couldn't help but stare. Thick lashes framed eyes, the precise color of the sea. Eyes that currently regarded me with an unabashed look. Shit. My hand shot to my mustache, which dangled off my face from the fall. Well, it had been a valiant effort, and while men might be proud, women knew when to get the hell out of a bad situation. I'm fine. I ducked my head quickly and tried to move past him, eager now to put as much distance as possible between us. Though I'd still done nothing wrong, there was no sense in poking fate. Sometimes she poked back. Just watch where you're going next time. He didn't move. You're a woman well spotted. Again, I tried to shove past him, this time with a bit more force than necessary, but he caught my elbow. Why are you dressed like a man? Have you ever worn a corset? I spun around to face him, reattaching my mustache with as much dignity as I could muster. I doubt you'd ask such a question if you had. Trousers are infinitely more freeing. He stared at me as if I'd sprouted an arm from my forehead. I glared back at him and he shook his head slightly as if to clear it. I, my apologies, mademoiselle. People were watching us now. I tugged fruitlessly at my arm, the beginnings of panic fluttering in my stomach. Let me go. His grip only tightened. Have I offended you somehow? Losing my patience completely, I jerked away from him with all my might. You broke my ass bone. 
Perhaps it was my vulgarity that shocked him, but he released me like I'd bitten him, eyeing me with a distaste bordering on revulsion. I never heard a lady speak so in my entire life. Ah, uh, chasseurs were holy men. He probably thought me the devil. <laughs> he wouldn't have been wrong. I offered him a cat-like smile as I inched away, batting my lashes in my best impression of Babette. When he made no move to stop me, the tension in my chest eased. You're hanging out with the wrong ladies, Chas. Are you a courtesan then? I would have bristled had I not known several perfectly respectable courtesans. Babette not necessarily among them, damn extortionists. Instead, I sighed dramatically. Alas, no, and hearts all over Cesarin are breaking for it. His jaw tightened. What's your name? A wave of raucous cheers spared me from answering. The royal family had finally rounded the corner to our street. The chasseur turned for only a second, but it was all I needed. Slipping behind a group of particularly enthusiastic young girls, they shrieked the prince's name at a pitch only dogs should have heard. I disappeared before he turned back around. Elbows jostled me from all sides. However, I soon realized I was simply too small, too short, too slight to fight my way through the crowd, at least without poking someone without an, with a knife. Returning a few elbows with my own, I searched for higher ground to wait out the procession somewhere out of sight. There, with a jump, I caught the windowsill of an old sandstone building, shimmied my way up the drain pipe, and pulled myself onto the roof. Settling my elbows on the balustrade, I surveyed the street below. Golden flags with the royal family's crest fluttered from each doorway, and vendors hawked food at every corner. Despite the mouth-watering smells of their frights and sausage and cheese croissants, the city still reeked of fish, fish and smoke. I wrinkled my nose, one of the pleasures of living in the dreary gray peninsula. Cesarin embodied gray. Dingy gray houses sat stacked atop one another like sardines in a tin, and crumbling streets wound past dirty gray markets and even dirtier gray harbors. An ever-present cloud of chimney smoke encompassed everything. It was suffocating, the gray, lifeless, dull. Still, there were worse things in life than dull, and there were worse kinds of smoke than chimney. The cheers reached a climax as the Lion family passed beneath my building. King August, Augusta waved from his gilt carriage, golden curls blowing in the late autumn wind. His son, Beauregard, Beauregard sat beside him. The two could have, couldn't have looked more different. Where the former was light of eyes and complexion, the latter's hooded eyes, tawny skin, and black hair favored his mother, but their smiles both were nearly identical in charm. Too charming, in my opinion. Arrogance exuded from my, from their very pores. Augustus's wife scowled behind them. I didn't blame her. I would have scowled too if my husband had more lovers than fingers and toes. Not that I ever planned to have a husband. I'd be damned before chaining myself to anyone in marriage. I just turned away, already bored, when something shifted in the street below. It was a subtle thing, almost as if the wind had changed direction mid-course. A nearly imperceptible hum reverberated from the cobblestones and every sound of the crowd, every smell and taste and touch faded into the ether. The world stilled. I scrambled backward away from the roof's edge. As the hair on my neck stood up, I knew what came next. I recognized the faint brush of energy against my skin, familiar thrumming in my ears, magic, then the screams.